Good afternoon. Where do we stand currently in the course on general relativity? We have at the moment returned to, to some mathematical considerations in order to be prepared to treat matter. So we have already an understanding of geometry. We acquired that by going through a long mathematical part and then we have applied the mathematical concepts in order to understand certain interesting geometries, in particular the geometry of a black hole. And now we have to bring in matter, the stuff that is in the universe. And matter does not only include particles, but matter will also be, for example, an electromagnetic field. So there's everything that is kind of the content of the universe, everything apart that comes in addition to the geometry itself. Now to understand matter, I already mentioned that last time, you have to understand the notion, for example, of density and also later the notion of a current. And we will see, or I've already explained that to some extent on an informal level, that density is, a, is something that is a bit harder to understand in four-dimensional space-time than it is if we only work in three-dimensional space. Because in three-dimensional space, density is just defined with respect to that space that is given. Whereas in four-dimensional space-time, if you talk about the density, it's still meant to be a density with respect to space. But space is in a sense a three-dimensional substructure of the four-dimensional um, space-time. And therefore we have started to introduce a new mathematical object. And these are the so-called differential forms or N forms. And N could be any number in space-time, a number between zero and four. A zero form is just a function on the manifold. And a three form, for example, would be an object that takes at any point in space time as input three vectors, which define essentially, you should understand it as, for example, the space. So they define kind of what is the three dimensional substructure that we, con we consider as the space of simultaneously occurring things to, to for example, with respect to an observer. And that object then gives back a result. It's a tensor, so it gives back a real number. And this real number could then be understood in a way as the density with respect to that notion of space. Okay, so that's the context. And that's um, the reason why um, we have now to spend some time, at least today and also after tomorrow, Thursday, to understand um, these notions. One thing that we have already done is to actually introduce the definition of an N form. Remember, an N form is just a zero N tensor. So it's an object that takes N vectors as an argument, which in addition to just being a tensor is also anti-symmetric. So if you exchange two arguments, it just changes sign. Now we have also introduced a notion of multiplying such forms. And the multiplication between two forms, which we call the exterior product, is essentially the tensor product between the two forms together with an anti-symmetrization. Because the tensor product itself would not even be a form. It's not anti-symmetric. And I will now continue. And um, where we stopped essentially last time. And what we have to do is to understand certain properties. So we are um, talking about the exterior pro product and we have to understand certain properties of the exterior product. So let me just write that briefly so that we know where we are. Exterior product of differential forms. And as I said, I will not write down the definition again, but the definition is essentially just take the two forms and anti-symmetrize. And now what we get is a kind of product, and that's why it's called an exterior product, which you indicate with this little wedge symbol, which has certain nice properties. One of the properties, maybe the um, kind of commutativity type property is the following. We get something like commutativity up to a sign. And the sign depends on what 
the rank of these forms is. So we have this property here. So this is really like commutativity. You could say this, this product is commutative up to a sign. And here it's assumed that the first factor in the product is an M form and the second is an N form. I will not prove this property, but given the definition you have seen last time, that it's a tensor product anti-symmetrized, it's very easy to verify this particular thing. The next property is also very easy to see. It's kind of associativity. I mean, it really is that in this case, there is no additional sign. So let's suppose we have three different forms and then the exterior product has the property that essentially the brackets are not needed if we just have a sequence of such products. It always gives the same. And then the third property that I would like to mention is that if we take the exterior product between a zero form, and I indicate the zero form usually just with an F because I already told you a zero form is just a function. So a zero form only um, depends on where it is on the manifold and um, otherwise doesn't take any arguments. So maybe, okay, I just realized it's actually a bit dangerous to talk about functions. So when I, when I say that a zero form is just a function, then what I mean, it's only a function of the point in the, of the manifold. So it assigns a value to any point of the manifold. Whereas generally an N form or N larger than zero, for example, a one form, is at any point in the manifold, not just a value, but itself a linear function that takes as input, for example, a vector or several vectors. So indeed, that's what I mean when I say it's a function. So, and in this case, it's essentially just a multiplication. So the exterior product of between a function and, and some arbitrary N form is again an N form, which is essentially obtained by just scalar multiplication with the value of the function at any point. Okay, so that is maybe a, a bit a fast start because I immediately told you about properties which I don't even prove, but they will just be useful. So think of this as um, we have introduced a new type of product and we have essentially the usual rules that you know from products up to certain signs which come from the anti-symmetry that this product has. Now it may help a lot to understand this product and what it does if you look at things in a basis. So, so far this was rather abstract. We just said we have all these forms and we haven't talked about coordinates, but let's now kind of back up and, and try to understand all these things in terms of coordinates. So let me start with a one form. Of course, the zero form there, it's not really interesting to introduce coordinates. It's just a value at any point of the manifold. But a one form is something that takes a vector at any point in the manifold. Now a one form is simply just a zero one tensor because the anti-symmetry property is trivially true. There is nothing to exchange. There's only one argument. So a one form is a zero one tensor. And we already know that a zero one tensor can be written in terms of a basis, the chart induced dual basis elements. So these are called DXI. I hope you remember what they are. And corresponding coefficients. So in other words, this tensor here, so this, this zero one tensor can be written in terms of these coefficients times these zero one tensors, which incidentally can therefore also be seen as forms. So that's by itself a form because it's, it's again a zero one tensor. Now let's see what happens if, I mean, essentially we can now build up everything from one forms because what the product does, I didn't write this again, but you know that if I take an M form and an N form like here, then the total thing is an N plus M form. So I get arbitrary forms by just multiplying with one forms. I always increase the degree of the form by one. And that's useful. So if I, for example, let's just make this example one to consider a two form, then I could just, I mean, let me make an example of a two form. A two form is just taking a one form, for example, dxi, that's a one form for every possible value i. And I take 
the exterior product of this one form with another one form, dxj. Now, what is that? So remember, the wedge product, the exterior product was defined as being just a tensor product. So it's essentially this, together with an anti-symmetrization. So now you really see what it does. So it just actually exchanges the two things and puts a minus sign in front. That's what the anti-symmetrization does. And now you see very explicitly kind of what, what this thing does. So if you already understand tensor products, then it's just really this thing really in this basis. And I could now continue with three forms. And so one particular example of a three form would be dx1. And of course, I, this would now give a lot to write if I continue like that, so I will not do that. But let me just write this. So I could have something like, um, okay, let's put a different index here, dx i, dxj, dxk, and then the anti-symmetrization would just mean that I have all the different combinations of how I could order these things together with the corresponding sign. So for example, the next term could be that I could be obtained by exchanging j and k, and then I have this, and then I continue, and there are in total six expressions like this. I will not write them down explicitly, but probably see what the six permutations are. Okay, so it, maybe it's useful to keep that in mind. So whenever you see n forms and, and products, of course, you can then put the product products or reduce these products to these products of one forms. And then you just have this rule that I just showed here. So in general, if you have an n form, what's the a basis of the n form? So let's try to explore that. So again, we start from the fact that an n form is in particular a tensor. And we know that a tensor, a zero n tensor, takes n downstairs indices. So we have these indices, and then we have to put the basis. So far, I didn't use the fact that it's really an anti-symmetric form. I just used the fact that it's a tensor, zero n tensor. So what I've written down so far would be true for any zero n tensor. But now we know it's a form, so it's anti-symmetric. And because it's anti-symmetric, the components here of, these are the components, the components where I exchange two indices have to be the same up to a sign. Now notice that I sum over all possible components here. That's the Einstein um, summation rule as usual. And so I get often the very same term because once I, for example, have omega one, two and so on, and then another term could be omega two, one, and that's the same up to a permutation. So what I could do is to say, let's just reduce the summation to the case where the first index i1 is sm strictly smaller than i2 and so on up to i n. So now I write the sum explicitly because I'm not summing over all indices, all possible values of the indices I'm summing over under this constraint. Now, by the way, it can never happen that two um, indices are the same. And the reason for that is simply that this would not be anti-symmetric. So this, this expression could now be rewritten and this rewriting is only true because there are forms in this particular way where I have now essentially a, a kind of choice in the following sense. So let me, okay, maybe I'll, I'll just do that immediately. Let me just now write the exterior product instead of the tensor product. And that takes into account that I will have, of course, many more terms. So for example, if, if I have a particular ordering here, of the i ones until i n, so concrete values. Let's say I have only n equal two, and i is one, i one is one, and i two is two. Then from this part here, I get all the reorderings, as we have just seen here. That's um, what you see on the right hand side. So briefly, um, put, turn on the laser pointer here. 
So you see this this thing, this um, anti-symmetrization is now captured by this. So that's a, a way of writing a form in a basis. And I could now return, once I've realized that, I could return to the usual Einstein summation and say, let's no longer make this restriction, but, never, but let us nevertheless keep the exterior product on the right hand side. But now this would not be correct, this equality that I wrote down, because now I have many more terms. Now I sum again over all terms. So I have to normalize by the number of terms that I kind of summed twice. And this is over what this is achieved by putting this factor one over um yes um, no let's see no i think this is correct yes so the factor is kind of included here implicitly so i of course here i have all these terms and now i have to um to put the factor in front to make sure that if i sum here only over those this, or if I sum over all, they, they are only counted once in one order. So I hope it's clear. Okay, I think you just have to, to use this, let's say, basic knowledge about permutations to see that this, these equalities are correct. Okay. Yeah, maybe one thing I should point out is that there is, of course, somewhere a choice of convention. So, you see, I this n factorial that I have here is, could also be put somewhere else. I could equip, or I mean, that would be another convention. I could say, I define this thing here by putting an average over these expressions. So I could have here one over six. That would be a different convention, but that is not the case. So you should always think of this, um, this exterior product as really containing all the different reorderings without the renormalization. And that's why at the end you need to put the renormalization here because they appear here all in the different orders. And so you would have them twice. Okay, I think um, you can just ask questions if this is still unclear or just look at it again in a quiet minute. One, I, I now want to focus on one particular case. And this is the case where n is equal to d. So what is n? n is the form I look at. I want to look at an n form and d is the dimension of the manifold. So I look at a dimension whose degree or a form whose degree is as big as the dimension of the manifold. So now, according to what we have already, what we have just written before, I could now say, let me write this in terms of a basis. Now I have not, or now you could ask your, yourself the question, how many different components do I have in this particular case? So what, what are the different possibilities to put here? And you e easily see that because I need to have a strictly smaller, um, I have a strictly smaller sign here. So all the different indices have to be different. And I have only D different choices for the indices. I need to put the indices and because n is d, but because the manifold is d-dimensional, I also have only d different choices. The only possibility up to permutations is actually that I have an index, I have a indices one, two, three, and so on up to d. That's the only possibility up to reorderings. But if I now look, use this particular expression, I don't need to consider the reorderings. I just put the order here. So I have only one term in the sum. So here, this is dx1 and so on until dxd. So in other words, a d form on a d-dimensional manifold is an object that has only one component. And that's kind of interesting because you may have thought this is an enormously big object because the tensor usually a zero n tensor or an n n tensor. The number of components is n plus n or is d to the n plus n. But the anti-symmetrization collapses that all to one single element. By the way, this, uh, the, the same line of thought shows that you can never have a d plus one form on a d-dimensional manifold. There's simply 
there's simply no way to put all in all different indices in. You have only d possibilities, but need to put in d plus one. Okay, so in other what you have seen so far is d forms on a d-dimensional manifold are kind of again one-dimensional objects. They have only one component. So you could say this is actually the same as a scalar, because a scalar is just one number. And so this is indeed true in that sense. A D form is just characterized by one number. So at any point, in, so if you let's say we apply this again to space time, then this would mean a four form is something that assigns to any space time point just a number, this number. But this number is now basis dependent because you see this, this whole thing here is basis dependent. So there's still a difference to a scalar because in, in the case of a scalar, the number I assign to a particular point is just the number independently of whatever basis I will ever choose because this number has nothing to do with the tangent space. Whereas an in a D form is still an object that lives in the tangent space. It's actually a tensor and so on. So this is just a coefficient and therefore basis dependent. And this fact will become important later. Or maybe let me already give some physical intuition why this fact will be important. So a physical example of something that is a scalar. So let's suppose we are just talking about, again, space time. And a scalar would be the temperature. I could assign to any point in space at any time, and therefore to any point in space time, a temperature. So everywhere is just a temperature. I could read it off so it's as if the world had thermometers everywhere where I could read these um, numbers off. I mean, of course, the temperature would be divided without the thermometers, but this would be a way to actually see these numbers. I could imagine there are all these thermometers. So that's clearly a scalar. You don't need a basis. However, something like it that is of the type of a density. Um, okay, now maybe you should could even reduce just to space rather than space time. Of course, the temperature is defined everywhere in space. Now, if I look at the density, this the, a density is somehow not just a number because the density depends on how I measure volume. So density is always with respect to something. For example, if I talk about a charge density, what I usually mean is how much charge is in a little space element. So I have two things that I need to consider, the charge and the size of the element that I consider. And of course, we usually normalize that. We say, OK, we look at the charge per, um, um, per meter um, to the power of 3, or um, we look at, um, let's say, the mass per volume element and so on. But the volume element, there is no basis or unit independent way to define the volume index. To, to define the volume element. And changing to another basis or to another chart to other coordinates means usually or can mean that we change our units, for example. So in that sense, something like a density cannot be a scalar. It depends on, on a chart, on, on our measures, on, on, on the way we measure things. And that will always be the difference between N or D forms, even if they are one dimensional, they are something that has this additional aspect like a density, which is very different from a temperature. A temperature, of course, is also, at the end, I, I have Celsius, but it's not depending on something that measures out space, whereas a density depends on how I measure space and therefore charge depend or charge dependent. Okay, we'll see that in, in, in a more on a more formal level. Um, essentially right now. So let's just look at how this whole thing transforms. So let's suppose we have two charts. And now um, I just use again the notation you are used to from earlier considerations. I, I put the tilde if something is expressed with respect to the tilde chart. So you could imagine that I write this expression here. Or let me maybe write it here. So I could also write it in terms of another chart a tilde chart, and then everything would have tildes on it. Of course, the left-hand side would be the same. So I'm talking about the same tensor, the same form, but it's expressed with respect to a different chart. So the components are different, and the basis elements are different. Now let's try to understand how 
the coefficients transform. So how can I express omega tilde 1, 2, D, the single component in terms of the original omega? So actually, it's very easy to do that because we already know this is in particular a tensor or an element of a tensor, a coefficient of a tensor, and we know how coefficients of tensors transform. So we can just use that because after all, a form has to have all properties of a tensor. Now, if I forget for the moment that it's a form and therefore anti-symmetric, I would just write down the transformation rule that we have learned. And um, I hope you recognize that again, some time ago that we introduced these things, but essentially I have to multiply with um, these partial derivatives where on the top I have the old basis elements and on the bottom, the new ones, the tilde ones. And you see these individual ones correspond to these indices. So I start with one and end with D. So the last one has a D here. And here I sum over this I1 to ID and these I1s to ID also occur here. So that's the rule we already know. Now, the only thing we can hope to do is to somehow simplify it using the fact that the whole thing is anti-symmetric. This is indeed possible. So we can say, let's just try to write it just in terms of the element where the ordering is one, two, three, up to D. And of course I can do that because I know this is all anti-symmetric. The only thing that happens when I reorder things here is that I get a sign of the permutation. So I could say, instead of summing over all different combinations, I only take one and sign and sum over the different permutations separately as a permutation and put in the sign. So I can do this. And now I have to essentially keep track of the fact that this I1 that I had before would now be written as pi of one. So the idea is really that I, I write I1 as pi of one, pi, I2 as pi of two and so on. And I can do that because um, they're all different. So they can always be written as a permutation of one to D. Um, okay. So otherwise I, I just copy what I had before. So I copy this expression except for this permutation um, way of writing the whole thing. I get all these terms up to dx id is now written as pi of d and dx tilde d remains. So I didn't change anything on the bottom. So maybe I'm um, just for in case this wasn't entirely clear, the idea is really to write uh, the tuple i1 until i d as pi of one and so on up to pi of d. There's always for any possible d tuple of different indices, there's of course always a permutation. So if I sum over all permutation, I get all of those and therefore these two expressions are the same. And here I could also have written pi of one, pi of two and so on, but I don't do that because I already know they are anti-symmetric. I just take this into account by this sign here. Okay, but now you see something very interesting if you are, if you remember the course on linear algebra. So first of all, I just copy the first component. There's nothing more I can do with that. It's omega one to D. But if you look at this expression here, the sign of a permutation times something like this, where you permute here one element of a matrix. I mean, you think of these as elements of a matrix. So each of these term could somehow be regarded as a matrix and um, where the row, I mean, it's actually a Jacobi matrix where you have here um, one index, let's say the row telling you which X you take the derivative of and the other, let's say the column tel tells you with respect to which X tilde you derive. And now what this means is that you somehow take all elements of this matrix and multiply all of them in all possible different, different orders with alternating sign. 
And this is really the same as just taking the determinant of the matrix that is defined by these entries. I write it like this. So that's something you should know from linear algebra that if you interpret this as a, a matrix, so the matrix elements are the elements with i and j, and you take the determinant and write down the formula for determinants, you exactly find this expression. So in other words, what we have found is that indeed these coefficients here don't transform like scalars. A scalar would just transform trivially, would be basis independent. They transform in a non-trivial way, namely they get multiplied by the determinant of the Jacobi matrix. And of course, this determinant is not generally one. So this is a non-trivial rescaling. And you see now actually that indeed if you would change scales. So let's suppose someone measures space in terms of meters and someone else in terms of inches. Then what you would have here is a factor. And let's suppose otherwise you would keep all directions the same. What you would get here is a factor that each time, let's say the x is the, cent is the meters and the x tilde the inches, you would get something like a factor that says how, how many inches is one meter. And actually you get n times or d, so this factor is multiplied d times because the determinant of a, of a d times d matrix involves the multiplication of d such terms. So we get this factor to the power of d. So it's a bit like a volume. And that's indeed what you would expect if you transform densities from one unit system to the other. You would get a factor that is essentially the translation between the units, like meters into inches to the power of d, the dimension of space. So here we have now a more formal statement of what I try to tell you as a motivation that we need anyway a quantity that transforms like that. Of course, um, I mean, this was not the motivation. We already know a scalar cannot be the right thing, but that this thing is, is the correct thing is not yet proved. We have just now shown that this particular thing transforms in a way which would indeed correspond to the way we would expect densities, for example, to transform. But still at this point, this is all an intuition. And um, I mean, this connection to densities and so on, we will make that one more precise. What we did do in a precise way is to elaborate essentially the transformation rules of forms, of coefficients of forms with a focus now on a D form, on a D dimensional manifold. And that will be actually a main object we will study. So for the moment we will um, have a lot um, to, let's say the D forms on D dimensions will now play an important role in the next chapter, which is a chapter I announced, I think several times, which is the chapter integration on manifolds. That you can, of course, already see again has to do with densities and so on. Because what's really a density? A density is such that if we integrate over the density, so if we integrate the density over a volume, we get the total, for example, mass or charge or whatever density that is in that volume. So densities and integrations are, or the, the concept of integration are kind of related. And that's why this occurs here in our considerations. But before I start with this new section, let me just briefly stop and ask whether there are any questions that you may have up to this um, point where we did a rather, let's say, technical treatment now of something abstract. And I hope things will now become, we have to again fill things with life. So this was really very abstract. Why, why forms? So we have just an object that transforms in a particular way. I hope that the next section, this integration section, will give you at least a more geometric picture about what this is all about. Okay, if there are no questions, then I will just continue at this point. So we have to, we have always considered manifolds that are um, I mean, differentiable manifolds, so they have certain structure. And in order to integrate on a manifold, I, I need to introduce one more piece of structure that we haven't considered so far. And this piece 
is an orientation. So an orientation is something that in a way tells us that a certain part on a manifold, so if you, for example, think of a manifold as a surface, that somehow tells us that this surface also has a sign. So a surface can kind of have a positive or negative sign. And this is kind of so, something useful because if you, for example, think of a sphere, then you may want to say, you want, may want to distinguish whether you now look at the kind of outer surface of the sphere or the inner one. And you would somehow say these um, two surfaces have different orientation. And in order to do that, we need to actually put the restriction on the atlas that describes the manifold. So remember that a manifold is essentially just described by the atlas, which contains all the charts of the manifold. And now what we are doing is the following. We say that an orientation or an oriented manifold, or well, let me just call it an orientation. I think that's better. So I will now not write the usual thing. We're always talking about the manifold, M and so on. So an, an orientation on a manifold M, so M is always the manifold, is an atlas such that all, all chart transition maps These are the maps that allow us to essentially glue together the individual um, pieces of the atlas, satisfy a relation. And the relation is the following, that the determinant that we just considered, or let's, I mean, now for whatever reason, I'll um, put the inverse. And of course, that's true in both directions, whether I go from tilde to x or from x without tilde to x tilde, that this determinant is strictly positive. By the way, this determinant is never zero because a chart transition map is um, injective and, re and reverse and revertible, and the revertible map cannot have, or the corresponding um, determinant of the Jacobi matrix cannot be zero, but it can be strictly positive or strictly negative. Now, now what we are saying is that the atlas is defined in such a way that this determinant is always positive. So one way to think of this would be if you really take a real atlas of the globe of, of Earth, you may in principle have a chart that is kind of mirrored. So where it would look a bit strange to us. So somehow um, Europe, the east of Europe would actually then be um, the part that, um, that has a beach to the Atlantic and so on. So um, it would be a very strange atlas. So the usual atlas that we have has this property that it has an orientation. But if you look back into the definition of manifolds, that's never required a priori. So, so far an atlas could have had these mirrored charts and everything would have been fine. Now we are disallowing them. So from now on, we, we are kind of assuming that a manifold has this orientation. So it's kind of the usual atlas um, that we have that defines this orientation. Of course, we could have two different orientations in the sense that we could have one atlas that is as we are used to and one in which all the charts are mirrored. That would be another valid orientation. And um, of course, we, we choose one in the sense. I mean, we cannot combine them. We have to work with one atlas because otherwise we get chart transition maps that flip this determinant. Okay, so now we really have a nice atlas, which is much closer to what we usually consider an atlas. Let's now immediately turn to the definition of an integral, which is the purpose of this whole thing. So let ux be a chart. So from now on, of course, I assume that um, it's, this chart is part of an oriented atlas of an n-dimensional 
oriented manifold. So an oriented manifold is a manifold for which I have defined such an orientation, such that Oh, uh -huh. actually, I, for um, I forgot to mention one important thing, building block, and um, let omega be a D form. So D is always, again, the dimension of the manifold, such that the support of omega is contained in the chart domain. So what does this, by the way, mean? The support of a, um, of a tensor in general, and the, in particular of a form, is the set of, is the closure of the set of points for which this thing is non-zero. So of course, a form assigns at any point of the manifold a tensor. And this tensor may be zero. And the support is usually defined in the context of differential geometry as the closure of this set. So you also take kind of the border of that set into account. And this is sometimes relevant when one discusses integrations. That integration, that's why I'm mentioning that here. But for the moment, we have therefore, I mean, you could now read this condition as saying that everywhere where the where the chart ends. So where like at, I mean, the chart is of course an open set, but at the edge of this open set, this omega is already zero. That's what this means. Because otherwise the closure couldn't still be in the in U. So in, in some way, the picture you should have of this for the moment is that if I have here a manifold, and then I'll um, let's suppose I, I have this chart domain u, then the support of omega is really strictly contained in u. So that's, of course, a special case. Later, we want to deal with channel omegas, but we start defining integration for such omegas. So what we're actually going to do is to define what it means to integrate over this chart domain u a D form omega. So we are notice we are not integrating over sc a scalar function, and we will never do that. Integration over a scalar function is not defined in differential geometry. This would is this will not give us. I mean, the reason is essentially it would not give us a chart independent number. There's just no way to define this in a way that does not refer to a chart. I mean, having said said this, we will still find a way to do it, but we will have to essentially define a form in a canonical way using the metric. But so keep that in mind. If you just have a scalar and nothing else, you cannot integrate over it on a manifold. Of course, we can do it on um, in analysis and where we kind of are in a way in flat space, so to speak. But on a manifold, this is simply not possible. Now, how is it defined? So it's defined via a chart. This is of course dangerous because whenever we define something via a chart, we will have to prove that at the end it's chart independent. Nevertheless, this is how it is. It's defined via a chart. So let me maybe also add this chart to the picture. So there's the chart. Let's suppose we have a chart map or a chart. I mean, we have it anyway. I will define it as part of the um, of the assumption u x is a chart. And now within this chart, I mean, the chart has some um, coordinate functions x1 and x2. And I, will, I want to integrate in the chart. But in order to not confuse the integration variables with these coordinates, I will call them xi. So xi are essentially variables that I take to integrate here in the chart, for example, in this direction. I could have called that also x1, but that may lead to certain confusions. So I integrate in the chart over xi1 to xi d, which 
and this is now just ordinary integration. So in some way, I reduce the, in, the definition of an integration on a manifold to the integration over numbers. So this is in a way just a, a d-dimensional integral over ordinary numbers of what? Of the coefficient function of the form evaluated at the corresponding points of the manifold, which are given by the xi. So of course, if I not want to know what is the form omega at the particular point, I need to back go, I mean, I need to take the coordinates in the chart and then transform it back into the manifold. So now I'm here and now I can evaluate what this thing here is. So see, it was still useful to learn about integration already before differential geometry, because otherwise the right hand side um, was not defined. So in other words, I'm not defining integration from scratch. I'm just reducing it to what you already know, essentially. Now, um, OK, maybe to make that clear. So x of u would be something here. And so you have to have already an understanding of what it means, what the right hand side means. That's what I just assumed. So I assume that you know that if you have d variables and the domain given on this d r d, then you know how to integrate. So integration over r d is here the basis of the definition. So indeed what the definition says is essentially just do what you would, no or would normally do if you were asked to integrate and use the coefficient function of, of the form and you will, you will get something useful. Now after the break, I think it's time for the break, we will have to prove several things. Actually we'll prove two important things. One is we will, we will prove that this definition is chart independent. If I go, if I, wrote down the definition of another chart map, x tilde or u x tilde, it gives the same numerical value. So that's at the end a numerical value because the integration gives a numerical value. The second thing we will show is how this whole thing matches to the intuition. And the intuition will essentially be that it really corresponds to somehow figuring out what's contained in the little volume in space. And that's of course what integration should do. So the, the, let's say physical or geometrical meaning of integration is that it sums up everything that is contained in a certain volume, in this case, maybe U or, or some subs or the whole manifold, if you like, if you integrate over the entire manifold. Before we make the break, I just want to finish the definition because this is still not a satisfactory definition because the definition still manifestly depends also on the choice of the chart domain on u. So you, you may ask, what if you want to integrate over something bigger, maybe over the whole manifold? And so we also define this, so integration over n is now just essentially given by taking the sum of the integration over the individual charts. So this is defined as taking a sum over many charts. So what you're doing is you take the integral and now I'll write this as follows. I write HK times omega and that's already the definition. I need to tell you what is HK where HK is actually a family of HKs, a family of functions, which is called a partition of unity. So what it means is that if I sum over the different HKs, so HKs are all functions, then I get get the identity function or the function that always equals one. And this may be a bit abstract, so let me finish this first hour with a little picture. If I draw now everything one-dimensionally, so let's suppose our manifold was one-dimensional, it's just this line, then a good partition of unity would be the following. So this, this direction is kind of the manifold, 
which is one dimensional or it could be more dimensional, but I draw it one dimensional and this would be kind of HK. So HK are functions that take only values that are positive. So partition of unity, and maybe write this here, also includes the fact that HKs are all non-negative. And you should think of them as follows. You have, for example, um, if the manifold, um, okay, the manifold may extend further to infinity. So maybe there's one HK that comes from here and goes down. So this is maybe H, let's say seven. And then there is another H, H eight, which raises here and goes like that. This would be H eight. And then there's maybe a next one H9. And all these H's have, um, I mean, you choose, you can now choose the H's so that each H has only support in one chart domain. So that this multiplication here is a function that is kind of constrained. So if you, for example, take, take H8, then it also only ranges from here to here. So now it's sufficient, if you want to integrate this for H8, it's sufficient to take the integral over a chart that only includes this part here. And then the same for H9 and so on. But the way the functions are arranged, make sure at the end you're always getting a total value of one, so to speak. So, I mean, this drawing is maybe not perfectly accurate, but the idea would be if you sum up all H's, you always get one at any point. And then you can probably see immediately that this makes sense, that this is just a way to somehow distribute the summation over the different parts or an integration. So I think this part should be clear. We have to go back after the break to understand this a bit better. Okay, but let's now make finally that break that I announced. And we will reconvene shortly after five. And as usual, I'll stay for questions. Let me maybe just before you ask questions say that um, or make you aware of the fact that I, I mean, as you know, the questions are usually recorded when they, I mean, during the break, the recording is on. So all questions you ask during the break will um, by default be on the recording. If you ask the question in the past or now ask a question and at the end don't want it to be on the recording, just drop me an email and I will cut it out. So that's not a problem at all if you don't wish to appear somewhere. And as I said, this is of course also something you can do for previous lectures. In, if for some reason you feel uncomfortable about something you said and don't want to appear on the videos. Okay, nevertheless, I hope I didn't now discourage you from asking questions, I'd rather encourage you because as I said, you can cut them out. So please feel free to ask whatever you think um, was unclear. Doris, was there anything in the chat? Yes, there are a couple of things. Well, the first thing is they are asking whether you can scroll down a bit the right part. Uh, this is now a bit late, yes. Yeah. <laughs> just, they just asked one second. Okay. And also there was a bit of uh, discussion about the, uh, the dimensions uh, of the manifold and of the form and whether they have to have exactly the same uh, dimension to be able to integrate on it. Because yes. I think you wrote mm -hmm. somewhere yes. N and D, you mixed, I think, them up uh -huh. at a certain point yes, in the may... definition. Oh, yes, right. Okay, that's a good point. Indeed, let me correct that. So here, um, I wrote an N. And indeed, I, what I did, I mean, it's not wrong, but it's misleading, because what I <laughs> did is to um, say that we are now, um, we have now a D form. And forms are usually called n. So n is now equal to d. So whatever was n before, so maybe the structure of this whole thing was the following. In the first part of the lecture, everything here, I talked about general n forms where n is arbitrary up to the point here where I said, let's now look at what happens when n is equal to d. And there we found that in this particular case, the form is given by one, co one single coefficient function. Now, when I started talking about the integration on manifolds, I was indeed also assuming that we have a form whose degree n is equal to d. So we have only a d form so far. Now, 
we will, of course, you want, you may want to integrate over a lower dimensional manifold, and we certainly want to do that. So, for example, when we have space time, we may want to integrate only over space and not over time. So, for that, what we will do, and that's what, um, the topic of after the break, we will introduce the notion of a sub manifold. So, a priori, the integration is actually really only defined for manifolds that have the same dimension as the form over which I integrate. But if I now want to have a manifold that has a higher degree, I can still use that definition. The only thing I have to do is to somehow define a sub-manifold with the right dimension. So for example, if I have three-dimensional space, and now I want to integrate over the surface of Earth, then I just define the surface of Earth as a sub-manifold of three-dimensional space. Uh, I will tell you what that means to be a sub-manifold. I think it's anyways a very intuitive notion. You probably can imagine what it is. And then we integrate over that new manifold, which is now a two-dimensional manifold. And there we have to integrate the two form over that manifold. So in that sense, um, the answer is yes and no. So formally, it's indeed restricted to D forms on D dimensional manifolds. But for applications, we um, by the notion of sub-manifolds, we can go to arbitrary other dimensions, lower dimensions of forms. I think there is still a, a, a D in the omega. You, you write one to N, but I think yes, it's one to D. There's another one. Yes, thanks. Yeah. So I and also before, here. Yeah, uh, and also before in the, uh, just after the determinant to be larger to zero, then in the, in the sentence you write, uh, be a chart on an N-dimensional oriented manifold, you should be, I think, D-dimensional. Oh, yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, just to be sure. Yeah, let me just you right. E is equal to n. Okay. Okay. Yes. And Thank also there yes. was. I sh should have written a d always. That's absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, and there was also one a bit more que uh, technical question where, yes. uh, if you already know when the final exam is or uh, when uh, we will know maybe. Oh yeah, no, I don't know. And um, currently the um, examination office is working on an exam schedule. And um, usually um, they have a very hard optimization problem to solve, in particular now in COVID times, because there is um, a lack of examination rooms, large enough rooms. So uh, we can only wait now and see what happens. I will, it will probably be announced at the same time to you and to me. So don't <laughs> ask me, I will not know it before you. Yeah, they were saying that probably uh, by the end of this week, we should know, but I think those are just, yeah, uh, you're doing an, a written exam, right? Yes, it's, it, yeah. it's going so to it be a written be exam, yes. So actually, I don't know how this works for um, people from the University of Basel, um, but the agreement so far, at least with the University of Zurich, is that the exam will also there be written. For ETH, it's anyway a written exam, this has been, the mode has been changed two years, uh, actually one year ago, two years ago, it was still oral. And um, I think this was, I mean, no longer sustainable because I had to take 250 oral exams, which was a bit too much. So it's now written. And I hope that um, it, it will nevertheless keep its kind of partially conceptual nature. So I did receive various emails from some of you regarding um, the format of the exam. So what I'll try to do is to have some questions which are kind of of the type of calculations. For example, you now just did maybe a, a calculation, the exercises about the time it takes um, an infalling particle to reach the singularity. And, and this is a calculation you should be able to do. So this may be an exam question. Similarly, there could also be an exam question um, of a more conceptual nature, for example, asking about, um, let's say, taking the topic of now, why, what would be the problem if we integrated over a scalar rather than a form, or um, more in a physics type question, for example, um, about all these, let's say, different perspectives of observers on objects in falling to a black hole, what would um, qualitatively Bob um, perceive when he looks at Alice falling into a black hole. We, we discussed that and, and there may be some conceptual questions about that um, and so on. 
but it will be a mix. So it's certainly, I mean, maybe I should um, therefore um, really um, encourage you to solve the exercises. Yes, so that's about that question. Are there other questions? No, no other questions for the moment. No. I think it's already, again, time to start anyway. By the way, I didn't forget there was a question last time at the very end where someone asked me about a calculation we did um, in the last lecture, which was, I think, not entirely correct, which was, I mean, this is the lecture of the seven, oh, that's, that's actually the wrong file. I think the lecture of the 17th of November, I made a calculation where I showed you just the order of magnitude, how much time it takes until you reach the singularity. And we wanted to determine that this takes a finite amount of time. So this result is correct, but to actually reach it, there is another difficulty that one has here to, I mean, I integrated here over dr, and the metric I used was the metric that was defined with respect to dx or um, this was another measure we introduced. And I would also have to make sure that the relation between dr and dx doesn't um, run into a thing, I mean, does not diverge. And I didn't do that last time. So this is something I may do after the end of today's lecture, just to um, um, make sure you understand that point as well. I mean, this is just for those who worried about that calculation. If you didn't, um, I think you can just look at the exercises anyway, and there this calculation is done in full detail. So there's no need to stay to the end or to stay for that part. But I'm, I discussed that because this question came up last time and I, I did, couldn't immediately answer it last time. Okay, so what we did now is to, to define integration. And as I said, we have to prove two different things. One is to understand the intuition behind it to, uh, to understand that it's related to how much stuff is in volume. And the other thing is to make sure it's basis independent. Okay, so how do we show that something is basis independent? That's um, actually the usual trick. We just essentially calculate, we write it down in another basis and, and check whether we get the same result. Um, in other words, what we do now is to kind of show chart independence. And by the way, I could have avoided this if I had a definition which was not chart dependent. However, this definition is really chart dependent. One may think of other definitions and maybe towards the end of today's lecture, I could give you a hint about how one could have defined it alternately in an alternative way, which would not require that proof, but is otherwise maybe more involved. Now, the chart for the chart independence, let's suppose we have two charts, ux and u tilde, x tilde. Now, of course, if you want to see whether it's chart independent, we certainly have to integrate over the part which is covered by the two charts. If we integrate only over u and, and u is not covered by u tilde, there's no point in, in comparing it. So let's therefore integrate over the intersection between the two charts. And if it's valid there, then we are of course happy because then we know that whenever a function is defined um, in a domain that is covered by the two charts, then we get the same result from our integration. Okay, now I'll just start writing down again the definition of our integral. And I remember the definition was that we just integrate over psi one to psi d, over the coordinates psi one until psi d, which um, are the integration um, variables that correspond to x one to x d. And what do we integrate? Again, it's just the actual component of um, of the form that we integrate of omega with respect to that chart. So that thing could have a tilde. Now it doesn't because I start writing it down in the original um, 
chart, the one without tilde. So, okay, I didn't do anything so far. I just copied the definition again. Now what I'm doing is something you again know from analysis, from analysis of multiple variables. And this is um, the rule which tells you what happens if you just change integration variables. Of course, that's related to changing the chart, but now you can, we are now already in kind of multivariable analysis. So this integration has, is defined even if you don't know anything about the manifold. It's an integral over certain variables of a function which depends in a certain way on these variables. And now I can change variables. And of course I will change to the variables that correspond to the other chart. So I want to integrate instead over d psi tilde one until v psi tilde d. Now I still integrate the same function. So as I said, this is now not a chart. I haven't yet done the chart transformation. I'm just saying I still express the component of the non-tilde chart um, as a function, however, of the new integration variables. So I just use the rules for changing variables. So I express everything in terms of psi tilde, psi tilde one until psi tilde d. I think the point I want to stress is that this is something you already know. I'm not now already using um, what we did before. So I'm not trying to cheat in some way. So, but what do you know from analysis if you change variables is that you have to multiply with the determinant of the Jacobi matrix. So we get indeed, I mean, okay, maybe if I write it in terms of variables, I could have written xi there, um, but yeah, let me write it in terms of xi, because then it's really clear that this is just about these integration variables. So I express the xi i's in terms of the xi tilde i's. And if I do that, then I need this Jacobi matrix here or the determinant of it. And actually it's the absolute value of the determinant. So just to make sure you remember, so this is just analysis. I don't know which here, but maybe analysis two or three or so. Let me, on the safe side. I'm not sure you have analysis three, but something like that, some analysis course. Now, um, this thing is, this determinant is essentially the same as writing dxi because I just renamed the variable to, from x to xi to make sure you can distinguish between the integration variables and the chart map. So you see, this is a chart map. It really takes variables and maps it, or the inverse maps it back to the manifold. Whereas these size are the integration variables, but I could have written it also in that way. Of course, still with an absolute value. Now we are almost done because we have already done quite some work in the first hour. What we did in the first hour is to find out that Look here on the right hand side that the omega tilde is given by omega times exactly that very same determinant. So what is written here up to the um, absolute value, what is written, okay, so what is written here times this is indeed just omega tilde. Now I don't need to worry about the absolute value because we had an orientation. And remember, we defined an orientation to be a chart or an atlas so that the chart transition maps have a positive determinant. So I can just drop the absolute value. And then indeed, if I drop it, I can safely write that this is now equal to, so the integration variables don't change at all. They are still tilde, but now I just have omega tilde 1, 2d. And that's of course the expression, I mean, now I need still to check where it's evaluated. It's evaluated at X 
um, to the minus one of the, wherever I am in these coordinates. And that's of course the very same expression as the one we used for the definition, as you can see here. So indeed, we are chart independent. So we were lucky in that sense and <clears throat> can now really understand the left hand side of the definition or the whole definition of an integration over manifolds as something that is defined in a way that does not depend on our choices of charts. So it's a it's, it has at least a chance to have a physical meaning. Otherwise it wouldn't even have a chance. I mean, it's not clear that everything I can define that is chart independent is physically relevant. But the other direction is certainly true. It cannot be that something is physically relevant if it depends on the chart. Then it can only be relevant maybe with respect to me um, as let's say a relative thing, but it cannot have an absolute physical meaning. So remember, maybe just again, this is a bit abstract, but if I ask about something like um, um, what um, happens with, what are, um, tidal forces. So tidal forces are kind of the forces I would really feel because they kind of push on me or an object would actually be squeezed. And if I throw an object into a region where I have strong tidal forces, then this object will be destroyed. And whether or not it's destroyed will not depend on the coordinates I choose to describe it. So that's a physical thing. So therefore we know tidal forces are something physical and maybe if you have solved the exercises, you also have seen that tidal forces are essentially the thing that comes from the um, curvature, from the ge geodesic deviation. And so this curvature is therefore a chart independent thing. The components not, but at the end, the curvature itself is a chart independent thing. Okay. Now let's to the second thing that I announced, let's try to understand what this integration really does. What is its geometric meaning? So. And actually it's more a geometric meaning also of the forms that will become obvious via the considerations I'm now going to do. So let's once again, look at the manifold, which I sketch here. And let's suppose that I look at a little cube kind of on the manifold. Now that's not a very well defined thing, but let me try to define a cube on the manifold or a cuboid if you like. So a cube would be something which has all equal side lengths. Now we don't, for all we did so far, we didn't even use a metric. So we cannot really talk about lengths, but let's suppose we had a chart again and then I can at least define a cube relative to a chart. I could say if I have a chart, and of course I, as usual, draw just two dimensions, then a cube looks like, or a cube in the chart is something well defined. In two dimension, it's just kind of a square type thing. And let's suppose this cube has here dimensions lambda and lambda, so the same um, length in both directions. I mean, lengths, the same parameter lengths, which is not the metric lengths in both directions. So I have this cube. And now I could say, if I translate this cube back into the manifold, I get something that I could interpret as a cube. Of course, that's a chart dependent thing. Let me stress that again, but um, that comes close to a cube. Now, what is this cube? I could say that the side the sides of the cube are along direction vectors, which are essentially the direction vectors that correspond to the chart induced basis. So that would be the d to the dx1. And you should by now be familiar with this way of thinking. That would be the vector d to the dx2, for example. So this means that if this cube on the manifold is small, so if I make lambda very small, I essentially can think of this cube as something that is sp spanned by these direction vectors. And so in other words, let's again talk about the earth surface for the moment. There, um, of course, approximately, I'm, very sm I'm so small that the earth is essentially flat for me. 
So then I could defi that cube that I would define, for example, here in that room by just fixing a coordinate system and taking then the direction vectors into the coordinate directions would really look like an actual cube um, on this small um, region. But um, precisely I would define it um, on the chart where it's indeed a perfect cube. Okay, so far I didn't do actually anything related to integration, I just tried to define a cube. So let's now call that a cube. And this cube um, could, um, I mean, somehow still depends on lambda, on how, how large I make this. So let's assume that this is all included in this name cube. So I just call this orange thing the cube for simplicity. Now let's take an integral over that cube of some form. So let's suppose we have a d form, omega. This is an object we can integrate over and we now integrate over this cube. So what does it mean? Now, the, because it's a cube, the integration variables are all ranging from zero to lambda. That's what, what this um, cube helps me. That's actually the reason why I consider the cube so that I can write this integral in this particular way. Otherwise, I just put in the definition of an integral that we had so far. So we have x to the minus one, psi so one, I'm always copying over and over the same definition, essentially, of the integration that you probably now also know almost by heart. Now let's suppose that lambda is small. So I'll just put this here in. And now by small, I don't mean related to curvature or anything. Let's suppose it's small, so small that if I change, as long as I'm in this region, the value of omega doesn't change much. Let's suppose it's always almost the same value of omega. So omega is something that within that cube is approximately constant. Let's furthermore just call the point here at which the cube starts or at which I, um, one corner of the cube lies as the point P. And if I do that, then I could say, okay, um, the, this coefficient function omega one to D is just constant over the cube. So I just put in the value it has at the point P rather than the precise value it has at any location within the cube. So I keep the integration here. The only thing I change is that I evaluate this coefficient just at the point P. This is of course not perfectly true, but keep in mind, we keep lambda small. But now it's extremely easy to evaluate this integral. It's an integral over a constant. And this is just an integral in normal analysis. That's no longer on a manifold. We're already on this other part of the definition. So this integral is just lambda to the d. It's an integral over this cube times, of course, this constant that I have here, which is omega at p. Now let's try to remember what omega what a coefficient of a tensor means. A coefficient of a tensor actually means that I take the tensor and put in basis vectors, d to the dx1 and so on until d to the dxd. So that you should remember that this thing is really how I get the coefficient of a tensor. And I have to evaluate that just at the point P. So now remember what I said at the beginning, a tensor and, and in particular form takes is something that is defined at every point. So here I specify the point, but then at every point it takes as input also d different vectors if it's a d form. And now if I choose the vectors as the basis vectors, it gives me exactly this. That's why I put these vectors in. Uh, excuse me, could you yes. uh, scroll a bit down the right yes. part? Yes, yes, sure. Okay. Now let me just, by linearity, I could also um, put the lambda again into the expression and say that this is actually just lambda times d to the dx1 until 
lambda d to the d x d. That's I used here the multilinearity of the whole thing. Okay, so now we what I what did I do so far? What I did is I said that if we integrate over a little cube, then what we get is an expression approximately, if this cube is sufficiently small as something that doesn't involve an integral any longer, it's just the form evaluated for the vectors. And what are these vectors? These vectors are exactly the vectors here that define the cube, which were in this particular case, the basis vectors of the, the chart induced basis. But of course, this expression that I got here, this thing, and that the only place where the, the basis um, here is relevant are in the definition of the cube and here. So, of course, I can always, if you give me another cube, I can just define the coordinates in such a way that the cube is the one defined by the coordinate lines. So, this equality that we just proved could be written more generally. And that's actually not, I mean, hard. And this is really just this. This idea that I could first define the cube and then um, make the coordinates depending on the cube, that if I have an integration over a cube, which is, let me now put that just informally like that. Let's suppose I have d different vectors, v1, um, v1, and so on, until vd. So that's. What I mean by that is just the cubes bound by these vectors in that sense that I described above. So we have to assume these vectors are sufficiently small so that the cube is really um, approximately a real cube, if you want to think of it as a cube. Then what this expression tells me that to this approximation, so as to tell, maybe write in which um, when the, so, this holds for the cube being small compared to the changes of omega, then it's true that it's, it gives you the same as if I would put these vectors here, because these are exactly the vectors defining the cube. So I just put the vectors here, v1 until vd. And now you really see what a form actually means. So a form is all, as I mentioned several times, is an object that takes as input vectors. Now, what does it, does it mean? What does the value mean that you receive as an answer from the tensor or from the form? As I said, you should always think of these objects as actually you query them. So you query them with these vectors, it gives an answer. And the answer is essentially the integration over a cube of of that defined by these vectors in some way. So in that sense, the integration is just a way to somehow extract the information that is infinitesimal. So this is kind of infinitesimal information. This holds for very small um, cubes. I mean, we derived it in the limit where the cube is very small. Then it corresponds to this integral. So you can think of the integral as kind of the extension of what a form tells you locally. So a form tells you locally for, for a small, very small region, an answer, for example, how much stuff is there and the integration does the same, just the integration is defined over a larger region in some sense. So integrations and forms are in that sense very closely related. That's what this equality says. A form is essentially telling you something about the content of a volume. And the integral is, of course, also telling you something about the content of a volume. OK, now this is still quite abstract. And I hope that in what follows, we can make um, this now or bring this closer to things that you have already seen. For example, in electrodynamics, where you're probably familiar with integration over, for example, surfaces or little volumes and so on. And I will now tell you something that will make this relation hopefully quite obvious. But to do that, we first need to look at so-called submanifolds. So we 
um, for example, want to see what it means that we have a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. So let me do that. Um, okay, that's a little section on submanifolds. And I'll just make two little definition. An embedding from a manifold M to another manifold N is a smooth map Okay, maybe let me give it the name. Let's call this embedding phi. Is a smooth map such, or of course that's the map phi, such that phi is an isomorphism between M and its image phi of M. Okay, so this definition is best understood by drawing a little picture. So we have a manifold M, and in this case on the right hand side, I will not draw the chart. Instead, I will draw another manifold. Let's suppose we have a higher dimensional manifold. So I'll draw it maybe, okay. Yeah, it's now harder to draw. Let me just draw a little um, cube as a, let's say, indicator for a higher dimensional manifold. Now, um, the embedding phi takes this, let's suppose the left is a two-dimensional one, the, the, the right a three-dimensional one. It kind of creates an image in the three-dimensional one. And this image will, of course, be two-dimensional. So it may look like this. Let me try to draw this. It's somehow like a surface that is in lies in this cube. Okay, the drawing is not very beautiful, but I hope you can see the idea. There is a two-dimensional surface in the cube. And that's, if you now look at the definition, so phi is indeed a mapping, it has to be smooth, so differentiable and so on. And it's an isomorphism from M to the image. So the green thing is now the image. Um, that's phi of M, of M. And it's isomorphism, that it is an isomorphism means that it's in, partic in particular revertible. So any point here in the image has an origin here in the manifold. So this is a way to define surfaces for example, in three-dimensional space, I get the two-dimensional Earth surface. Now, another definition is um, the following. And this is a bit, let's say, yeah, a strange definition in a certain sense, because so far you have to remember that the manifold always consisted or was essentially an open thing. So a manifold is something that is topologically open. Now we want to have manifolds that have boundaries. So for example, we want to say that we just take a manifold and put the plane that bounds it. So we, for example, we, we bound, we, we split space into two halves. Then strictly speaking, according to the previous definitions, this is no longer a manifold because this cut is not open. It's kind of a, I mean, I could take the cut out, but if I want to, keep the cut as part of the manifold, then it's topologically no longer open. But we need that. So now we define this. So we said that a manifold is set to have a boundary. And the strange thing, it's actually strictly speaking, not really a manifold. So I need to, would, if I was really rigorous, we need to return to our original definitions and say that actually we defined something new. We defined so far manifolds which are open and now we define manifolds with boundaries. But of course, this really means the same as saying we could have thought from the beginning as many, I mean, we could have defined manifolds keeping this thing, leaving this open and now say we 
we distinguish between those that have boundaries or not. And I would like to go along that route and say that if you assume manifolds to be something general, we said we say that such a manifold has a boundary if it is locally homeomorphic. So homeomorphic, remember, means that the topology is the same to the half space. Um, so, so far a manifold was just homeomorphic to the full space. And now we are looking at Rn minus, Y minus. So this is essentially the space defined by coordinates Xi1 until Xi n, which are part of Rn. But I constrain it so that Xi1 is strictly negative. By the way, it's, I could also have taken the positive part. It's somehow a convention that has to do with the orientation that I'm doing it in that particular way. And OK, so essentially, it just means that if I take a chart, so I have the manifold, so the manifold really ends now somewhere. And if I now take a chart, so let's say this is the chart domain, then this boundary has, of course, an image in the chart. So if this is the boundary of the manifold, then this boundary is now actually mapped to the Xi. And only now, because of this convention, only the negative part is kind of part of the manifold. So I better also draw an arrow here that goes down. So that's the image you should have of this. And the next definition is maybe more a terminology, and then we are done with definitions. The boundary, which I call del M, is the N minus one dimensional submanifold. And submanifold just means it's one that can be obtained by an embedding from the larger one, which is really just corresponding to the boundary defined by the chart. So um, remember, we said the boundary is just a point where x1 is 0. So I'm just um, requiring this. So if I take the chart map and look at the first coordinate, then this is 0, which is exactly this orange part. So that would be del n. So let me put that into the picture. So it's a bit cumbersome to do these definitions, but that's what they are. I, mean, I think at the end they are intuitive. It's just not very elegant in some sense to go here to the charts, but at the end it, it serves a purpose. We have now manifolds with a boundary. Now I want to start doing something which is um, often feared by students. But it's actually extremely nice. And I hope that I can convince you that this is something you should really embrace and not fear, namely the exterior derivative. And um, those who took the course electrodynamics last semester um, that I taught are, should already be familiar with that notion. But I will not assume you are. I will just um, give essentially an introduction into that. But it's anyway a more general notion now, if you are in manifolds, than it was in electrodynamics, which was essentially in flat space time. So what is an exterior derivative? So let's suppose we have an n minus 1 form, omega, little omega this time. And um, on a n-dimensional manifold, so now, before that, and this was a question that was asked in the break, and when we integrated the, dim the dimension of the manifold was always d and the form was d. Now we will, this will no longer be the case. Now we look at an n-dimensional manifold, which could itself be a submanifold of a d-dimensional one. And we look at an n-1 form. 
um, which is again a different degree. So can we integrate such an n minus one form omega on an n-dimensional manifold? Of course not, because we only defined what it means to integrate an n form on an n-dimensional or a d form on a d-dimensional manifold. However, the boundary of a manifold, so let's suppose we, we take um, u should be a kind of a chart. Okay, I'll, I'll not write this. You know, u is always a chart of the manifold. In m is the original manifold, u is a chart. If you take the boundary of u, that's a manifold with one lower dimension because you see, I mean, it's set here. The boundary is, of course, has one dimension less. That's obvious because I fix the value in one dimension. So I'm only left with r n minus one. So the boundary is also an n minus one dimensional manifold. So I can integrate over the boundary, which is a new manifold. That's why everything works. I, I now said the boundary is again a manifold. So I can safely integrate an n minus one form over the boundary, which is itself n, dimen n minus one dimension. Now this is kind of the, this, I call it desiderata. So we want something which will be very useful. Namely, we want to say that if we need to integrate over the boundary of something, this is usually messy. It's, it's kind of difficult to, to integrate over a boundary, maybe. I mean, that could be one motivation. Let's try to see whether we can somehow express an integral over the boundary as an integral over its volume. And actually, that's something you're very familiar with. If you think of Gauss's theorem, then it tells you that if you integrate something over the boundary of a volume, then you it's equivalent to integrating the diversion of this. So if you're integrating the a vector field over the boundary of a volume, this is equivalent to integrating the divergence of this vector field over the whole volume rather than only the boundary. And in some sense, what we want here is the same. We want to say there should be an object, which I call d omega, over which I could integrate, but over the volume and get the same value. Just to make here the things clear. So this is, as I said, this is n minus an n minus one form. And this is, of course, n minus one dimensional. So everything is okay here on the left-hand side. U is n-dimensional, it's just a chart of the original manifold. So this thing has to be an n-form, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So that's what we want somehow to define it. That's the idea of an, ex so that will be the exterior derivative. And so in other words, you could think of the exterior derivative of something that takes such an object over which you can, over which you can integrate over, a, for example, a surface and turns it into another object over which you can integrate as a volume and get the same result. Now, why is this even called a derivative? And actually to understand that the best way to do this is just to think of this expression that I just wrote down in the maybe simplest possible way or version, which is the one where n is equal to one. So let's try to do that. So let's just see what happens if we put n equal to one. So now we have an integration over a zero form and the zero form, so let f be a function. So I told you before that I always call zero forms f because they're just functions. So if I integrate over, okay, maybe I'll first draw something because otherwise it will not help much to do this. So let me, uh, yes, could, we, could you scroll down on the right? Yes, of course, yes. And then there was also a question. Yes, uh, please. Um, so, well, let me. So there, there is this question about the, you defined um, the embedding as an isomorphism and they were a bit confused about the thing um, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we did not define these isomorphisms on manifolds and also the fact that, yeah, they were, they were thinking might, might be diffeomorphism, otherwise we don't have the, 
the oh, injective yes. part. Did I say isomorph? Okay. Yeah, I I'm think sorry. I, I think this was just a mistake. I should okay. have been this geomorphic. Thanks a lot for noticing this. So this should be indeed a diffeomorphism. Yes. So it's differential in both ways and it's invertible. Yeah, sorry about this glitch. That's absolutely correct. So of course it's always, I'm very glad to see that people notice errors because that then is a good sign that people are understanding what's going on. So in this particular case, now that I want to consider n is one, so the picture that we would have would be a slightly strange one because, okay, what's the picture if n is equal to one? If n is equal to one, then the u would be something one dimensional. So u is a, a chart domain of a one dimensional manifold and therefore itself one dimensional. So the U would be that. Maybe the manifold itself could be larger, it could extend further. So M would be the whole thing, and U is just a chart domain that is kind of a restricted part of it. Now, what's the boundary of U? The boundary of U actually consists of this point and this point. This would be the boundaries of U. So actually, let me just call these points P and Q, whatever. Um, yes, let, let's just call it like that. So what does it now mean to integrate over du? So, okay, that may not be obvious if you look at the definition, because, okay, the, it's actually an integral over nothing, so to speak. So let's go, briefly go back to the definition. So the definition tells you that you have to integrate over all the d different dimensions. But the dimension here of the boundary is zero because the manifold original one was already one dimensional and now we reduce to the boundary, which is zero. So there is no integration left here. It's what you are doing is essentially just evaluating the function at the points. So it turns out, if you look at the definition, that this is essentially just evaluating the function at the points. And we have two points, fp and fq, and we'll have to add them. And actually, okay, maybe I'll come back to that later. It turns out because of the orientation, these points have actually an orientation. And that orientation is um, such that one of them will be negative. Maybe that's already kind of intuitively clear. If I generally, if I have a boundary, so if you for the moment think of this U as being something extended, then the boundary would usually be a direction of the circle. So you would kind of move in this direction. But if I just have a one dimensional thing, then the boundary still can, you could think of this point as something being directed in this direction or in the other way. So they have kind of opposite direction and that's why you get this. So this is a bit strange maybe, but that's what you get in this particular case. But let's now look at the other side of the equation, which is this integral here. So, sorry, that was wrong, EF, what's this? So what would be the expression? I mean, we still don't know what it is. We just said it's a desideratum to somehow have an expression which gives the same as the thing that is on the left hand side. Now, what could be the object that when we integrate it gives us this difference? Now, of course, when you know calculus, it, it's almost obvious that what this means is really what almost what how you would understand this in, in analysis. You just take in some way the differential of the function and integrate along. I mean, from here to here, and then you exactly, okay, maybe actually the signs would be in this particular case different. So let me here put, put the Q and P like that. So this would really be an integration along the path here, along U. So maybe I'll, because we haven't even a formal definition, so 
car, but let's just put that as an idea. So that would correspond to integral over differential d of the differential of the function f. Okay, so that may not help you very much. So let me give you another example, which actually makes this connection that I mentioned before to, to electrodynamics. And I will do that as the last thing for today. This is done very quickly. So let's now go to a higher dimension. And I hope that at least in one dimension, either the zero dimension or one dimensional thing I told you now, or the next thing I'm going to tell you makes you makes it possible for you to establish certain connections. So what happens in the case where, let's say, um, we start with a three-dimensional manifold. So let's now look at n equal to three. And let's just, um, to, to make this relation clear, call, um, call the op, or let's just look at something we already know. So you know Gauss's law from electrodynamics. What does Gauss's law tell you? Gauss's law tells you that if you have a volume, and I call the volume I now call u, of course u is a three-dimensional thing, and I integrate over the boundary of that volume some field, for example, the electric field. I mean, it could be any vector field, but that's at least what you know from um, electrodynamics. And you integrate in such a way that you take this, this field and multiply it with the normal vector of the boundary. Then you know, or that's what Gauss's law tells you, that this is the same as integrating over the whole volume of the, the divergence of the electric field. And then the V, this is just the integration of the volume component. Now what we will actually see is that this is really a special case of what we are doing. If you take this whole object here to somehow mean that this is the integration over something you call E. So you would understand E now not as a vector field, but in this particular case as a two form. And you would you could understand the, the divergence of E as the DE, as the exterior derivative of the vector field of this two form. So that would be a three form. Then you see this expression here, this equality now corresponds to the thing we were desiring, as I said um, before. So that would be. Of course, the integration over du and u. And so what I'm trying to say is that this is something you already know. And the thing that we want to have, the way we want to define the exterior derivative is such that it essentially corresponds to such expressions and generalizes them in a way. And maybe if you have one minute left, I could even if you the case n equal two. I think this is such a nice analogy that and you should also know about that. And that corresponds to Stokes. So in this case, um, we look at the surface. So let's not call it U, but S because it's a surface. And what you know is, for example, if you take a magnetic field or any vector field and integrate over the boundary of a surface. And the boundary of a surface is of course itself given by the sequence of vectors dl, so we could integrate over it, then Stokes' theorem tells us this is the same as if you take the rotation of B of the vector field, which is itself a vector field, and integrate it over the surface, multiplying with the surface vectors. Again, this will be a special case of what we are defining in the sense that the vector field B would be under, understood as a one form, not a two form. And the right hand side here and the DB would be a two form. 
So you see, actually the electric field here has a different role, is a different object in this generalized view than the magnetic field. So in, in three dimensional electrodynamics, you would just think they are the same. Usually say these are just vectors, three dimensional vectors. But if you look at things in this particular way, then you could say, oh no, th this is actually a two form. And the two form in three dimensional space has three components, three different components. You can easily verify that. Whereas the B field corresponds to one form, if you want to integrate it over that and, and um, D then D of a three form corresponds to the divergence, whereas D of a two form corresponds to the rotation. Okay, so this was all kind of a motivation. So at this point, you cannot verify, I mean, just to make this clear, you cannot verify that these are the same things. But what we are going to do next on Thursday is to really give a precise definition of this, of this D, which satisfies this desired equality and which allows you to understand that indeed these very well-known expressions correspond to our desired equality and furthermore that objects you know about already like the divergence or the rotation are actually just special cases of an exterior derivative. So in other words you already know a lot about exterior derivatives. An exterior derivative is something that you have already seen just not under that name. The divergence and the rotations are just that. Okay, I think that's all for today. Sorry for um, kind of keeping you over time. Um, I wish you a nice evening and hope to see you again on Thursday.